Why does Peter Thiel, one of the most famous billionaires on earth, have an essay called The Straussian Moment, referring to an obscure or relatively obscure political philosopher named Leo Strauss? And what can we learn about the relationship between the world of great tech founders and the world of political philosophy by studying Thiel's essay? Well, that's what I hope to accomplish with you in this video. We are going to walk through Peter Thiel's essay, The Straussian Moment, together in detail to give you a sense of what he was arguing, what he meant, and why it matters. So here it is, Peter Thiel's essay, The Straussian Moment. You see that it begins with an excerpt from Alfred Lord Tennyson, Loxley Hall, and we'll actually leave that for later, reading the rest of the essay first, and then in fact, I'll leave it for you to return to that poem once we've gone through the essay to see what sense of it you can make then. The 21st century started with a bang on September 11th, 2001. In those shocking hours, the entire political and military framework of the 19th and 20th centuries, and indeed of the modern age, with its emphasis on deterrent armies, rational nation states, public debates, and international diplomacy was called into question. Okay, so the essay starts with the attacks of September 11th. Why? Because they inaugurated the 21st century with some crucial changes, changes to the political and military framework of the 19th and 20th centuries, and indeed of the modern age. So we're going to see that it is one of Thiel's aims in this essay to consider the very foundations of the modern world. And whether he thinks the attacks of 9-11 were the catalyst, ultimately that forces us to rethink that, or whether he thinks that they are somehow just part and parcel of the process that is leading to the undermining of the modern world, we can leave open, but calling the modern world into question is the very first sentence of this essay. How could mere talking or even great force deter a handful of crazy, determined and suicidal persons who seemingly operated outside all of the norms of the liberal West? Okay, on one hand, the liberal West with its norms. On the other hand, the terrorists. And the question, how could mere talking or even great force deter the terrorists from operating outside the norms of the liberal world and attacking those norms? And what needed now to be done, given that technology had advanced to a point where a tiny number of people could inflict unprecedented levels of damage and death? Okay, so a lot of questions packed into this opening paragraph. The awareness of the West's vulnerability called for a new compromise. And this new compromise inexorably demanded more security at the expense of less freedom. A compromise that you're all aware of now. On the narrow level of public policy, there needed to be more X-ray machines at airports, more security guards on airplanes, more identification cards and invasions of privacy, and fewer rights for some of the accused. Overnight, the fundamentalist civil rights mania of the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, which spoke in the language of inviolable individual rights, was rendered an unviable anachronism. September 11th, you see, inaugurated a world in which we traded our liberty for security. Even as the debate over freedom and security gathered strength, whatever military force could be mustered was used to track down those responsible for the violence of September 11th. Despite rapid mobilization, those efforts met with limited success. America's antiquated military was not suited to fight such an enemy, for the enemy needed to be pursued not only in America or in a handful of terrorist camps in Afghanistan, but to the very ends of the earth. Even worse, like the Hydra, the enemy proliferated, so that for every slain jihadist, 10 more arose to seek martyrdom in perverse emulation. On the broader level of international cooperation and development, September 11th called for wholly different arrangements. The issue of unilateralism and of the institutions designed to provide a cover for unilateralism could be raised publicly by serious people for the first time since 1945. Much has been said elsewhere about the relative roles of the United States and the United Nations in the political sphere, but the underlying debates extend to even more fundamental issues, and Thiel is now going to address those issues here. For present purposes, he writes, it is worth drawing attention to one such fundamental issue, the, 20, the 20th century policy debate about the containment of violence. Following World War II, the centrist consensus on international development 
called for enormous wealth transfers from the developed to the developing world. Under the aegis of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and an array of other organizations, hundreds of billions of dollars were funneled in cheap loans or outright grants to third world governments, thereby, as the theory went, fostering economic growth and prosperity. Right? Give them money, elevate them to the first world, or at least pay them off enough for them to stop posing a significant challenge of any kind, and uh, there you go, you'll contain violence. But was this consensus right? Are economic incentives, in fact, powerful enough to contain violence? Uh, it looked beforehand like wealth transfers made a certain amount of sense in the late 1940s. Those who had taken Marx seriously and were haunted by the specter of communist revolution hoped the wealth transfer apparatus would help win the Cold War and bring about world peace. For the Rockefellers to keep their fortunes and their heads, it was perhaps prudent for them to give some of what they had to the wretched of the earth and make them a little bit less wretched. And in case you're offended by the language there of the wretched of the earth and you think that this is Thiel being uh, some sort of horrible person, no, he's referring here to a book by uh, Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth, and he's not himself uh, slandering or insulting um, those who received economic development, uh, economic development funds. Okay, but after the fact, one wonders how policymakers could have been so naive. Let us set aside the inconvenient fact that the wealth transfer apparatus never worked as advertised so that the West's wealth was largely squandered on white elephant projects, no real economic development took place, and even in the best of cases, the money supply circulated simply back to the West, ending up in Swiss bank accounts held by third world dictators. Okay, so let's set aside that inconvenient fact. As recent events have illustrated vividly, the real problem with the theory goes much deeper. For when the long expected blow finally came, it did not come from the favelas of Rio de Janeiro or from starving peasants in Burkina Faso or from Tibetan yak herders earning less than a dollar a day. On the contrary, it came from a direction none of the modern theories had predicted. The perpetrators were upper middle class Saudi Arabians, often with college degrees and with great expectations. Their mastermind, Osama bin Laden, had inherited a fortune now worth an estimated $250 million, mostly made during the Saudi oil boom of the 1970s. Had he been born in America, bin Laden could have been a Rockefeller. Okay, so that shows you that the economic question couldn't be the decisive one, because here you had somebody with quite great wealth who nevertheless attacked the liberal world, its norms and institutions. In this way, the singular example of bin Laden and his followers has rendered incomplete the economically motivated political thought that has dominated the modern West. Uh, from the wealth of nations on, right, uh, on the right to Das Kapital on the left, okay, so from Adam Smith to Marx, and to Hegel and Kant and their many followers somewhere in between, the brute facts of September 11th demand a re-examination of the foundations of modern politics. The openly intellectual agenda of this essay is to suggest what that re-examination entails. So let's see again. We have Peter Thiel, we've got his essay, The Straussian Moment. We start with 2001, 9-11, the attacks. And you have the attacks forcing us to rethink the foundations of the modern world. In particular, to rethink the consensus that you can contain violence with economic transfers and economic incentives. Uh, the problem is on the left and on the right, the dominance of economic interpretation of politics or the economically motivated political thought that has dominated the modern West, whether we're talking about Adam Smith or we're talking about Kant and the, even in between all of these other, excuse me, uh, Marx or Adam Smith or Kant or Hegel, we are now forced to reconsider the foundations of modern politics. That's a big task. And Thiel declares that this openly intellectual agenda is to suggest what that re-examination of the foundations of modern politics entails. So a nice project set out here. And whenever you're thinking about the foundations of politics, in this case, the foundations of modern politics, it is perfectly sensible to turn to the question of human nature. Because as you can see, if you think that the causes of violence are primarily economic and that the way to contain violence is primarily economic, then you have implicitly there a certain theory of human nature, why people act, what they want, what makes them violent, and what could make them peaceful. 
But if you're going to re-examine the foundations of modern politics, you need to reopen the question of human nature. And therefore, Thiel does just that in this next section of his essay. From the Enlightenment on, he writes, modern political philosophy has been characterized by the abandonment of a set of questions that an earlier age had deemed central. Okay? From the Enlightenment on, modern political philosophy, characterized by the abandonment of a set of questions that an earlier age had deemed not just somewhat interesting, not just kind of important, but central. What is a well-lived life? What does it mean to be human? What is the nature of the city and humanity? How does culture and religion fit into all this? For the modern world, the death of God was followed by the disappearance of the question of human nature. Okay, this is a very important paragraph just setting out the general idea that a crucial set of questions were dropped in modernity from the Enlightenment on. And this, this disappearance, as he continues, had many repercussions. If humans can be approximated as rational economic actors, and ultimately even Adam Smith and Karl Marx agree on this point, okay, so the economic theorist of the right, the economic theorist of the left, then those who seek glory in the name of God or country appear odd. But if such odd people are commonplace and capable of asserting themselves with explosive force, then the account of politics that pretends they do not exist needs to be re-examined. Okay, we could say roughly parallel to what Thiel is arguing here about 9-11, you could say something similar about Trump when he was elected, right? You can't have a political theory or a model of the world that makes the election of Donald Trump, Trump impossible. You, you can't have that, obviously. You have to take account of his supporters. You need a model rich enough to make sense of the fact that people wanted him as their president, enough people to vote him in at least once. And so here too, if you have a model that has no room for love of country, no room for love of God, no room for zealous, religious, uh, theocratic violence, and you try to reduce everything to a uh, lowest common economic denominator and it doesn't work, then you have a problem with your model. There is though, of course, in contrast, I add here to the, um, to the modern tradition, there is an older Western tradition Thiel continues a tradition that offered a less dogmatically economic view of human nature. That older account realized that not all people are so modest and lacking in ambition that they will content themselves like Voltaire's Candide with cultivating their gardens. Instead, it recognized that humans are potentially evil or at least dangerous beings. And while there are vast differences between the Christian virtues of Augustine and the pagan virtues of Machiavelli, neither thinker would have dared lose sight of the problematic nature of humanity. The most direct method for comprehending a world in which not all human beings are homo economicus would therefore appear to involve a return to some older, excuse me, to some version of the older tradition. So the modern tradition is dominated by its economic outlook. The pre-modern or non-modern or classical or ancient tradition wasn't. So therefore we could in principle just return to the ancient tradition and try to understand our world that way. But Thiel asks, how, um, however, before we try to embark on that return, there's another mystery we must confront. Why did the older tradition fail in the first place? After all, it seemed to ask some obvious and important questions. How could these questions simply be abandoned and forgotten? Right? Like it seems like if the old tradition was so much better, why was it replaced by something worse? It must have failed in some decisive respect, or what? On the theoretical level, Thiel continues, the older tradition consisted of two radically incompatible streams symbolized by Athens and Jerusalem. An enormous gulf separates Athens from Jerusalem. Pierre Manent summarizes this division in the city of man. Quote, in the eyes of the citizen, what value is there to the mortification of the Christian when what matters is not to fall on one's knees, but to mount one's horse. And the sins one ought to expiate, or rather correct, are not the sins one commits against chastity and truth, but military and political errors. In the eyes of the Christian, what value is there to the political and military endeavors of the citizen when he believes that victory or defeat, whatever the regime, this world is a veil of tears ravaged by sin, 
and that states are nothing more and better than vast bands of robbers. To each of the two protagonists, the sacrifices the other calls for are vain. Okay, competing commitments here. On one hand, the religious commitments of the believer and the church, and on the other hand, the, as it were, secular commitments of the citizen and his country, his city, and those are incompatible, or as Thiel put it, uh, radically incompatible. For a long time in the Middle Ages and thereafter, the West tried to gloss over these conflicts and instead to build on the many things these traditions had in common. But in the long term, like two giant millstones grinding against one another, city and church wore each other down as they went from conflicts to conciliations. Each one's efforts to return to its original truth had strangely wrought its own defeat. Neither side ever could win decisively, but in the long term, each side could decisively discredit the other, thus giving rise to the modern quote-unquote individual who defines himself or herself by rejecting all forms of sacrifice. Since the city and the church reproach one another with the vanity of their sacrifice, the individual is the man who rejects each form of sacrifice and defines himself by this refusal. So you had the city, you had the church, you had Athens, you had Jerusalem, and rejecting each of them and the sacrifices that they require, you have instead the individual. In practice, this dialectic was never simply or even primarily intellectual. For when one takes these questions seriously, they have serious repercussions. And the same holds for the modern and inverse moment that involved their abandonment. The early modern era of the West, the 16th and 17th centuries, was characterized by the disintegration of these two older traditions and by ever more desperate attempts to force everything back together into some functioning whole. Where agreement over questions of virtue, the good life, and the true religion was unraveling, the immediate attempt involved forging such an agreement through force. This force escalated in the periods of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation and culminated in the paroxysm of the Thirty Years' War, which remains perhaps the most deadly period in the history of Europe. By some estimates in Germany, the locus of the conflict, well over half the population, was eradicated. However, at the end of this process, agreement had become more elusive than ever, the differences greater than ever. The violence had failed to create a new unity. This failure was formalized in the Peace of Westphalia, so that 1648 can be fixed as the single year that dates the birth of the modern era. Questions of virtue and the true religion henceforth would be decided by each sovereign. The sovereigns would agree to disagree. Inexorably, questions of virtue and religion became private questions. Polite and respectable individuals learned not to talk about them much because they could lead to nothing but unproductive conflict. So quick pause here. How did we get then from the old teaching to the new teaching? The old teaching was characterized by this radical tension, this somehow irresolvable conflict. The attempt to resolve the conflict was very violent and still failed. And so the substance over which there was a conflict was relegated to the private realm, to the private domain. And publicly, the word of the sovereign was the way things are. Okay, so you see, polite and respectable individuals learned not to talk about virtue and all the rest of it too much because they could lead to nothing but unproductive conflicts. For the modern world, questions about the nature of humanity would be viewed on par with the struggle among the Lilliputians from um, Jonathan Swift about the correct way to cut open an egg. Hobbes, the first truly modern philosopher, boasted of how he deserted and ran away from fighting in a religious war. A cowardly life had become preferable to a heroic but meaningless death. Um, it is sweet and fine to die for one's country had been an important part of the old tradition. Henceforth, it would be seen as nothing more than an old lie. Okay, so these old things that were once important, questions about the nature of humanity, courage, and uh, you know, fighting for your fatherland, all of these things were treated as nothing more than an old lie. And so the Enlightenment undertook a major strategic retreat. If the only way to stop people from killing one another about the right way to open an egg and evolve a world where nobody thought about it too much, then the intellectual cost of ceasing such thought seemed a small price to pay. The question of human nature was abandoned 
because it is too perilous a question to debate. That's the first crucial point that you must think about and consider. What is the relationship between the modern era, modern political thought and modern philosophy, the desire to overcome violence, and the abandonment of the question of human nature? Okay, that is a package deal. You have to think about that together. And what, therefore, is at stake when we're rethinking the foundations of the modern world? We're rethinking the nature of violence. We're rethinking the question of human nature. So John Locke, the American Compromise. Thiel now turns his attention to discuss the, um, some of these modern thinkers. You see, he's not going here into Plato and Aristotle and uh, Augustine and Aquinas. No, he's taking, we're starting here with the modern American compromise on the question of human nature and the figure who's most important for that, John Locke. The new science of economics and the practice of capitalism filled the vacuum created by the abandonment of the old, uh, older tradition. That new science found its most important proponent in John Locke and its greatest practical success in the United States, a nation whose conception owed so much to Locke that one exaggerates only slightly to describe him as its definitive founder. By the way, let me just uh, underscore for you something he says in this opening paragraph to make sure you don't miss it. Uh, the question of human nature is replaced by economics and capitalism. Because okay, so thinking about what makes man man is replaced with economics, capitalism, production, consumption, money. Okay, and the higher questions and the higher uh, standards are abandoned. We must return to the 18th century to appreciate the tremendous change Locke wrought. Revolutionary America was haunted by the fear of religious war and the fanatical imposition of virtue on the entire state. The Declaration of Independence's evocation of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness had a counterpoint in the older tradition in which the first two had not existed, okay, right to life and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness would have seemed inferior to, and certainly much more subjective than, the virtuous life. Okay, so don't think that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is this like eternally present standard in the history of mankind. No, it's something new, and it's deliberately modern and non-ancient, okay? For the reasons that he just said, there was no right to life, or there was no right to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness would have seemed something less than the virtuous life. When one fast forwards to the America of the 1990s, the larger context of the founding had been forgotten. America had proved so successful in shaping the modern world that most Americans could no longer recognize the originality and strangeness of its founding conception. Locke's personal example is instructive of the subtle path toward the liberalism of the American Revolution. Locke's argument proceeds in an understated manner. He does not wish to inflame passions by taking sides in the contentious debates of the 16th and 17th centuries, but since it would be offensive to suggest that the things that matter most to people are silly or irrelevant, he must avoid inflaming passions by openly denigrating all those who do take sides. Okay, so he's not going to take a side, but he also can't insult the people who take sides. In no place is there a greater need for sensitivity than on the question of religion. Religious passions had led to religious wars, but a passionate repudiation of religion, and of Christianity in particular, did not promise peace. Locke, did not need the examples of the French or Russian revolutions to know this. Okay, so he has to avoid taking sides and also avoid looking like he's not taking sides. And uh, you can neither fully embrace Christianity nor fully reject it. He's got a delicate problem on his hands here. And so, Thiel continues, the philosopher takes a seemingly moderate path. In the reasonableness of Christianity, the philosopher sets out to denounce those justly decried atheists who have openly questioned the importance of the rules set for mortals by the deity. But in the process of this denunciation, we learn many new things about those rules. Locke teaches us that the command for children to honor their parents does not apply if the parents have been unnaturally careless. Marriage remains an important compact, but the wife has, in many cases, a liberty to separate from the husband, and the first and strongest desire God planted in men is not love of God or others, but a healthy concern with one's self-preservation. Unfortunately, the state of nature is an ill condition, so that those living in it are needy and wretched. The escape from nature, however, provides the path to self-preservation and happiness. It follows from this that humans are not stewards of nature, for God has provided very little to start with. 
but are themselves the creators of wealth and property. Labor makes the far greatest part of the value of things we enjoy in this world. From there, the stretch to capitalist basics is modest. Avarice is no longer a mortal sin, and there's nothing wrong with the infinite accumulation of wealth. It follows quite naturally that the law of God in nature says that government must not raise taxes on the property of the people without the consent of the people, given by themselves or their deputies. As for the person of Christ, Locke informs us that Jesus' words were not to be taken plainly. If Jesus had told people exactly what he was up to, the Jewish and Roman authorities would have taken away his life. At least they would have hindered the work he was about, for his teachings would have threatened the civic order and functioning of government. And so Christ concealed his meaning so that he might live and teach. Locke's conception of Christ is a world removed from that of the medieval passion plays or the passion of Mel Gibson. Still, the character Locke attributes to Christ comports rather well with the character that one reasonably might attribute to Locke himself and the passionless world he set out to create. Over time, the country founded by Locke would do away with Christian religiosity, even as it maintained many outward appearances of it. The United States eventually would become more secular and materialist, though most of its citizens would continue to call themselves Christians. There would be no catastrophic war against religion of the sort one had in France or Russia, but there would be no counter-revolution either. Only occasionally would conservative moralists express their perplexity at how a nation ostensibly founded on Christian principles could ever have drift drifted so far from its original conception. Never would it cross their minds to think that this process of gradual drift had been a part of that original conception. Okay, so do you see? Locke, in effect, the founder of America, just about the founder, okay, almost the founder of so great importance is he to the American project and the American self-conception. He doesn't speak out against Christianity. In talking about the reasonableness of Christianity, though, he interprets it in a way that makes it perfectly compatible with his own understanding of liberalism and capitalism. So you can say Locke offers a sort of reform of the Christian teaching, or he lets his teaching wear the outward appearance of Christian doctrine. And built into Locke's political strategy is, as it were, the gradual weakening of what would be a fiery Christianity in favor of a fading away of the Christian element and a coming into prominence of the economic capitalist and liberal element. Okay, so that's what's described here. How do you delicately resolve the problem of diffusing what you see as a religious bomb without either, you know, uh, throwing it or having it blow up in your hands in just the way that Locke does here, according to Thiel. In a capitalist world, violent debates about truth, whether they concern questions of religion and virtue or questions about the nature of humanity, interfere with the productive conduct of commerce. It is therefore best for such questions to be eliminated or obscured. You see again here the relationship between, on one hand, violence and the question of human nature, or of the most important things, of the first things, of the substantive things, and the need for a peaceful economic order. Okay, so it's best, in the capitalist view, for such questions to be eliminated or obscured. Thus, in Hobbes, all human complexity is reduced to the desire for power. Quoting Hobbes, the passions that most of all cause the difference of wit are principally the more or less desire of power, of riches, of knowledge, and of honor, all of which may be, may be reduced to the first, that is, desire of power, for riches, knowledge, and honor are but several sorts of power. Okay, so everything reduces in Hobbes to power here, all human complexity reduced to the desire for it. In Locke's essay concerning human understanding, the author celebrates the conception of power while stripping it even further of anything that is specifically human. The will is the power to prefer one action over another. Liberty is the power to act on this preference. The understanding is a power. A substance is merely the power to produce certain empirical effects. But these effects tell us nothing of the nature of the underlying substance. Once again, Locke proceeds cautiously. He does not directly tell us that human nature does not exist or that the older tradition of Aristotle and Aquinas is definitively wrong. 
He does not seek that clear a break with the past, but he undermines the older tradition relentlessly. For when we observe things, and these things include other people, we can see only their secondary effects as manifested by their various powers. We cannot know anything about their true natures or substances. It is an irreducible part of the human condition for humans to be limited so that they can never know anything about the nature of humanity. To ask a question about human substance or the teleology of humanity's power leads to debates as meaningless as whether the best relish were to be found in apples, plums, or nuts. Okay, once again, what are we talking about? Okay, we're talking about the problem of human nature, the question of human nature, and how that question is deliberately delegitimized by Locke in his presentation so that it gets sort of defined away. It's not even something you can discuss, both because it interferes with our production and consumption because it distracts us and gets us into violent debates and disputes, but also it's sort of defined away as a non-problem. You can't even answer it. You can't go there. It's like not the kind of question you can answer. It's meaningless. It leads to meaningless debates in Locke's presentation. In the place of human nature, continuing with Thiel's uh, exposition, Locke leaves us with an unknowable X. This awareness of ignorance provides the lobe of solid ground on which the American founding takes place. Okay, what's the awareness of ignorance? Ignorance concerning human nature. We, know, we don't know what the human is. We can't know what the human is. Therefore, we have an unknowable X, okay? This human X may have certain wants and preferences, but nobody is in an authoritative position from which to challenge those desires. And so in a somewhat paradoxical manner, the unknowability of X, okay, the human X, leads to classic liberalism and the very strong assertion of the different rights that belong to that unknowable X. The freedom of religion, for we cannot ever know what people are truly thinking in the temple of their minds. The freedom of speech, for we cannot irrefutably criticize the way people express themselves. The right to property and commerce, for we cannot second guess what people will do with the things they possess. Capitalism concludes Nobel laureate Milton Friedman is simply what humans do when they're left alone. Let me just pause here to comment again. So you've taken the question of human nature off the table. You've replaced it with a question mark or rather with an unquestionable X. X designates the unknowability of the human being. But erected on that unknowability of the human being are some very firm, solid, stable, liberal rights. So you have the stability of liberal rights erected on the unknowability of the human being. And this is a sort of modern configuration that Thiel is here walking us through. Of course, there are all sorts of hard boundary cases. One might wonder about what a libertarian framework has to say about the rights of children or criminals or insane people or the limits of commodification, extortion and interest rates, indentured servitude, prostitution, sale of body parts, and so forth. But... For Locke and the other American founders, these exceptional cases could be deferred for later consideration. In any event, the general principle of the unknowability of the human X would encourage a gradual expansion over time of the field of human freedom. Again, let's restate this from the opposite perspective. If you knew the human X, if it was a determinable substance, if it was a well-structured or well-ordered soul, if it was something precise and limited and delineated, then it wouldn't, probably would not be, or we could say would not be characterized by these bundles of rights and freedoms that depend on its being unknowable. So it's like, if you think the human being is a soul with um, reason, will, and desire, and that reason is the highest part of the soul, and that reason operates best when it contemplates eternal truths, and next is its practical function, and that the desires can be high or low, and the will can be corrupted or uncorrupted, then you have sort of a specific picture of man, and he's no longer primarily free to do whatever he wants, and somehow you've changed the whole topography of the human and the social and the political life, you know, on the basis of a determinate and uh, more or less delineable view of human nature. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about... You've crossed that out, you've declared it unknowable, then you've erected rights as the protection of freedoms, freedoms premised on this unknowability. 
There is uh, one important, especially important category of boundary cases. Atiel continues, and that concerns the question of origins. We shall return to that broader question later, but here it's worth noting one specific variant. Even though we should not interfere with people disposing of their property as they see fit, how do we know that the property was acquired justly in the first place? The great importance of strong property rights would seem to force us to ask some hard questions about the origins of the property itself. Once again, however, Locke, okay, this modern solution, urges us not to worry too much. There's very little value in the state of nature, okay, the state before it's been admixed with human, uh, human labor, and most value has been added by human work or intellect. As a result, we need not reflect on the past and can focus on the future. Most new wealth will be created by the strong enforcement of property rights going forward and will be enjoyed by those who play by the capitalist rules. Those who acquired their property through violence will not be capable of growing their fortunes and in time will possess only a small and uninfluential fraction of the world's wealth. Locke would dismiss out of hand Balzac's sweeping and subversive notion that behind every great fortune there lies a crime. We need not heed Brecht's call for more inspectors and inquisitors, Nothing should stop us from enjoying the prosperous tranquility of the capitalist paradise we have built for ourselves. Okay, so Thiel here is highlighting the fact that in Locke's system, system in which property rights play such a great role, Locke has to bracket or ignore, diminish, um, and hide, as it were, the question of whether and to what extent violence lies at the origin of acquisition of first property right ownership. Now, as you needless to say, no, there are leftist critics of liberal capitalism who make their criticism all about the fact that property is fundamentally violence or that it's at first violence. And therefore, they you see a lot of this in the anti-colonial or decolonial, uh, decolonialist and decolonialism rhetoric, where they want to say, you know, we are on the unceded territory of such and such peoples and so on. In other words, trying to reverse the process from the apparently legitimate property right claim to the actually illegitimate act of violence involved in that first appropriation. Okay, but at any rate for Locke, at any rate for Locke, nothing should stop us from enjoying the prosperous tranquility of the capitalist paradise we've built for ourselves. Since September 11, our peace has been broken. For there remains another very important boundary whose existence the American people had forgotten, they had forgotten about the rest of the world and its deep division from the West. So the first boundary the West forgot was the boundary of uh, violent acquisition and then you know peaceful preservation. And the second was the boundary between the Western world and the non-Western world. They had forgotten about the rest of the world and its deep division from the West, Thiel continues. The non-Western world had not yet seen the peace of Westphalia. The progress of the Enlightenment has occurred at different rates in different parts of the world. And in that world outside the West, questions of religion and the purpose of humanity remained central. Even in 2001, the greatest fear was not the fear of a painful death, like it might be for Hobbes and Locke, but fear of what would happen to one in the life after that death. Okay, so the non-Western world did not share the basic Enlightenment presuppositions and accordingly the Enlightenment anthropology of the modern West. And so a religious war has been brought to a land that no longer cares for religious wars. Even President Bush, who styles himself a religious conservative, cannot bring himself to believe that it is religion that really matters. Quoting Bush, this great nation of many religions understands our war is not against Islam or against the faith practiced by Muslim people, unquote. Where Bush downplays the differences, Bin Laden emphasizes them, contrasting the world of pure Islam and the world of the decadent West in the most extreme way imaginable. Quoting now Bin Laden, the love of this world is wrong. You should love the other world. Die in the right cause and go to the other world. Now I have to interject here briefly and say, I think it was like six weeks ago, maybe even less, that uh, there was a trend apparently, a viral trend on TikTok of people discovering, rediscovering bin Laden and apparently now sympathizing with his quote unquote letter to America or with his criticisms of American liberal capitalism. So somehow things in that sense in some circles are going uh, uh, all the way back to where they started. People now um, who are dissatisfied with Enlightenment, modern Western liberal capitalist political anthropology, finding common cause with even the Islamist 
criticisms of it. So that's an amazing thing to think about. Uh, unfortunately, though, continuing here with the essay, Bin Laden is not simply an irrelevant crackpot of the sort that one might find screaming at the bemused spectators in Hyde Park. For Bin Laden, unlike Locke, hard questions of morality and conduct need no postponement. Their answers are clear and resolution cannot be delayed. Bin Laden is a passionate man of wealth and power, so that his personal example reminds us of the boundary cases Locke so readily dismissed. Indeed, the oil industry, the source of Bin Laden's wealth, presents one of the most glaring examples that run counter to Locke's felicitous generalizations. For most of the value of oil exists simply in nature, so that the quote-unquote labor that humans add by extracting and refining this oil is proportionally quite small, okay, versus Locke's theory that most of the value is added in the labor. At the same time, however, economies rise and fall on the price of crude oil so that it represents a significant share of the world's wealth. Indeed, the original expropriation of that oil built as many as half of the great fortunes of the 20th century. And so the developments the development of the oil industry presided over by autocrats and despots from Asia to the Middle East and Africa is the not so hidden story of crime on a scale so grand that the proceeds of that crime suffice to purchase respectability and almost everything else in helping to craft the post-World War II centrist economic policy consensus. The Rockefellers had forgotten their own family history. Of course, in the long run, it may well be that power and prosperity go to those who follow Locke's capitalist rules, so that in the long run, the religious fanatics who have so violently and suddenly interposed themselves will eventually lack the wealth and the technology needed to threaten the non-religious world the Enlightenment has built in the West. Okay, in other words, maybe in the long run, the powerful and the prosperous win. Uh, but none of this will matter if we're all dead in the short run, okay? So today, mere self-preservation forces all of us to look at the world anew, to think strange new thoughts, and thereby to awaken from that very long and profitable period of intellectual slumber and amnesia that is so misleadingly called the Enlightenment. A beautiful paragraph, okay? A beautiful thought and a beautiful uh, formulation. So mere self-preservation forces us, okay? So whatever else you may be interested in, presumably you're interested in self-preservation to a certain extent, especially if you're already a Lockean liberal capitalist type for whom self-preservation is of a special importance. And if that's the case, well, self-preservation today forces us to look at the world in a new way, to think strange new thoughts. And what's going to be primarily strange about them and what's going to be primarily new about them that they're going to go counter to the enlightenment presuppositions, counter to the intellectual slumber and amnesia that we've inherited and that we have wrongly evaluated only positively. Okay, so we now need to think about what we might have missed and what else there might be for us to see. Okay, this is a good one uh, sentence defense of the necessity of counter enlightenment thinking. Okay, which is a big part of what millermanschool.com offers. And so we next turn then to Carl Schmitt. So, okay, let's just review. Where are we in the essay? Peter Thiel, Straussian moment. We have the problem of September 11th, 9-11, the uh, Islamic attacks on the, uh, the Islamist attacks on the Twin Towers. You have the fact that this forces a reconsideration of the foundations of the modern world because it seemingly refutes some of our political and military assumptions, both the technological feat and the failure of the economic model. I mean, the model that economics, economic incentives can reduce violence in the most important cases. Okay, then we have the problematic history of the question of human nature, namely that it's been taken off the table in order to avoid conflict. And that was replaced by a Lockean model. Okay, a Lockean model. But that the Lockean model has proven to be a failure in part because of these two border cases, the case of the violent origin of property acquisition and the border of the non-Western world, but also with the fact that oil itself, such an important feature in the modern world, is not properly accounted for, so it seems, in Locke's model of labor and nature. Okay, and therefore we have to look outside the Enlightenment resources, outside Locke, 
not necessarily going to the pre-enlightenment, but going to something slightly adjacent, which is what he begins to do when he turns next to Carl Schmitt. So let's take a look. Why should one return to the older tradition when the newer world of commerce and capitalism at every point seems so much simpler and happier and more pragmatic? The German legal scholar Carl Schmitt offers an extreme alternative to Locke and all the thinkers of the Enlightenment. He concedes with the signatories of Westphalia that there never will be any agreement on the most important things, on questions of religion and virtue and the nature of humanity, but where Locke says that it is in humanity's nature to know nothing about the nature of humanity, that was our unknowable X, remember? Schmidt responds that it's equally a part of the human condition to be divided by such questions and to be forced to take sides. Politics is the field of battle in which that division takes place, in which humans are forced to choose between friends and enemies. The high points of politics, declares Schmidt, are the moments in which the enemy is, in concrete clarity, recognized as the enemy. The enemy is the one whose very presence forces us to confront the foundational questions about human nature anew. The enemy is our own question as a figure. Because of the permanence of these always contentious questions, one cannot unilaterally escape from all politics. Those who attempt to do so are suffering from the moments of supreme self-delusion. These include the signatories of the Kellogg Pact of 1928, which outlawed all war. Indeed, it is even worse. Quote, if a part of the population declares it no longer recognizes enemies, then depending on the circumstance, it joins their side and aids them. Okay, like if you are, you know, you're neutral, you're not taking sides, you're a peace lover, you're humanitarian, you know, you're not, you're not into the forest or against this logic. Uh, no, by doing so, you have decided. And in some cases, you've decided for the enemy even though in your high and mighty moralism, you think that you haven't. There's no safety in unilateral disarmament. When one chooses not to decide, one still has made a choice, invariably a mistaken choice, which implicitly assumes that humankind is fundamentally good or problematic. For Schmidt, it is a symptom of the political end. Now a long quote here of Schmitz. In Russia before the revolution, the doomed classes romanticized the Russian peasant as a good, brave, and Christian mujik. The aristocratic society of France before the revolution of 1789 sentimentalized the man who is by nature good and the virtue of the masses. Nobody scented the revolution. It is incredible to see the security and unsuspiciousness with which those, which, which, with which these privileged spoke of the goodness, mildness, and innocence of the people when 1793 was already upon them, a ridiculous and terrible uh, spectacle. So in other words, this is uh, Thiel, quoting Schmidt, telling us that if you believe in the goodness of human nature, well, there are historical examples that those who think that are suckers and they're blind and they don't see what's right around the corner. Absent an invasion by aliens from outer space, there never can be a world state that politically unites all of humanity. It's a logical impossibility. Now, another quote from Schmidt, the political entity cannot by its very nature be universal in the sense of the embracing all of humanity and the entire world. If the different states, religions, classes, and other human groupings on earth should be so unified that a conflict among them is impossible and even inconceivable, and if civil war should forever be foreclosed in a realm that embraces the globe, then the distinction of friend and enemy would also cease. So Schmidt says, the only way you can get rid of friends and enemies is if you have a, a global state, a world society, a single humanity, and that won't happen. That the, only by assumption will that happen if you have some sort of extraterrestrial and maybe not even then okay but so long as you have humans you're going to have friends and enemies you're going to have dispute and you're going to have several players not just one player as it were a multipolar world not just the unipolar world uh, for sure not a um, universal humanity but uh, fighting collectivities okay called states and peoples in the medieval catholic tradition schmidt sees the permanent political division of humanity as a pale reflection of an eschatologically conceived state of historicity, as, as Schmidt puts it, which ultimately forces people to follow or reject Christ. So here it's like, how are you going to divide the lines between friends and enemies? Well, are you with Christ or against him? He connects the political and the religious by declaring himself against the neutralizers, aesthetic inhabitants of cocaine, abortionists, crema cremationists, and pacifists. Just as pacifists believe that 
The political decision can be avoided in this world. So cremators, those who cremate, reject the physical resurrection and the religious decision that needs to be made for the next world. Okay, so just interjecting here, this is the sense in which you could say Carl Schmitt is a political theologian. The, he's got a political theology. The concept of the political, the friend-enemy division, is for him configured and oriented in some fundamental sense along the theological question of um, resurrection, um, incarnation, uh, and the rest of it. In this way, to continue with the essay, politics serves as a constant reminder to a fallen humanity that life is serious and that there are things that truly matter. And so Schmidt cites with great approval the Puritan Oliver Cromwell speech denouncing Spain. Why, truly, your great enemy is the Spaniard. He is the natural enemy. He is naturally so. He is naturally so throughout by reason of that enmity that is in him against whatsoever is of God. Whatsoever is of God which is in you or which may be in you. Okay, so in that passage you see on one hand enmity, natural enmity, and enmity over uh, being for or against God and being for or against that which is in us of God. When bin Laden declares war on the infidels, the Zionists, and the Crusaders, Schmidt would not counsel reasoned half measures. He would urge a new crusade as a way to rediscover the meaning and purpose of our lives, perhaps borrowing the exhortation from Pope Urban II at the Council of Claremont, who urged his eager listeners on to the First Crusade back in 1096, let the army of the Lord, when it rushes upon his enemies, shout but that one cry, uh, Dieu le veut, Dieu le veut. Okay, well, pause for a moment, and let's review. We just had the movement away from the Lockean compromise to Schmidt's uncompromising embrace of hostility and enmity. And how would a Schmittian deal with September 11th and with bin Laden? by a very strong, intense, and total declaration of war, where you're very clear who you're against, who you're for, you're either with us, or that kind of thing, okay? Uh, whatever its shortcomings, Thiel continues, Schmidt's account of politics captures the essential strangeness of the unfolding confrontation between the West and Islam. This strangeness consists of the radical difference between the way the confrontation itself is viewed by the two sides. Perhaps never before in history has there been such a radical difference. The Islamic side retains a strong religious and political conception of reality. It views its struggle with the West as a matter more important than life and death, because Allah will judge his followers in the afterlife by how they performed in that struggle. Bin Laden would quote with approval the speeches of Cromwell and Urban II, requiring almost no changes at all. The language still resonates and motivates heroic self-sacrifice. By contrast, on the Western side, if it can even be called a side, there's great confusion over what the fighting is for and why there should be a civilizational war at all. An outright declaration of war against Islam would be unthinkable. We much prefer to think of these measures as police actions against a few unusual criminal sociopaths who happen to blow up buildings. We're nervous about considering a larger meaning to the struggle. And even the staunchest Western partisans of war know that we no longer believe in the existence of a God with us in heaven. And then one encounters Schmidt's troubling challenge, a side in which everyone like Hobbes values this earthly life more than death, is a side where everyone will run away from fighting and confrontation. But when one runs away from an enemy that continues to fight, one is ultimately going to lose no matter how great the numerical or technological superiority may appear at the outset. Schmidt's solution to this impending defeat demands an affirmation of the political in the West. Okay, an affirmation of the political, an affirmation of friends and enemies, an affirmation of that. Here, however, one must confront an alternative and perhaps even more troubling conclusion. For let us assume that it is possible somehow to turn back the clock and set aside our uncertainties, that we can return to the faith of Cromwell and Urban II, that we understand Islam as the providential enemy of the West, and that we can respond to Islam with the same ferocity with which it is now attacking the West. This would be, Teal writes, a pyrrhic victory, for it would come at the price of doing away with everything that fundamentally distinguishes the modern West from Islam. A dangerous dynamic lurks in Schmidt's division of the world into friends and enemies. It is a dynamic that destroys the distinction 
and that altogether escapes Schmidt's clever calculations. One must choose one's enemy well, for one will soon be just like them. Okay, you see the point. You can't respond to the Islamic Jihad with a Christian crusade. You can't just mirror Islamic religious and political zealotry because then, in defense of the West, because then you will have given up what it is to be the West. Somehow the West includes the fact of its modern enlightenment. And if you reject that and you just become a mirror, um, a mirror image of your enemy, then you've lost what should define who you are. And therefore there's a sort of puzzle that Thiel is uh, thinking about and uh, a danger that he's warning against. If one agrees with Schmidt's starting assumptions, he writes, then the West must lose the war or lose its identity. One way or the other, the persistence of the political spells the doom of the modern West. But for the sake of completeness, we must also consider the inverse possibility, indirectly hinted at in the margins of Schmidt's own writings. For while it may well be that the political guarantees the seriousness of life, and that so long as the political exists, the world will remain divided, there's no guarantee that the political itself will survive. Let us grant that unilateral disarmament is impossible, at least for those who value survival. But is it not possible, perhaps, for everyone to disarm at once and for everyone to reject politics at the same time? There can be no worldwide political entity, but there's a possibility of a worldwide abandonment of politics. The Hegelian Alexander Kozhev believed that the end of history would be marked by the definitive abandonment of all the hard questions. Humanity itself would disappear, but there would no longer be any conflict. Uh, incidentally here, an amazing thesis, and you should all read Alexander Kozhev, not only his debate with Leo Strauss in the book On Tyranny, but also his introduction to the reading of Hegel. But uh, to return to the essay, here's the quote from Kozhev. If man becomes an animal again, his acts, his loves, and his play must also become purely natural again. Hence, it would have to be admitted that after the end of history, men would construct their edifices and works of art as birds build their nests and spiders spin their webs. The definitive annihilation of man properly so-called also means the definitive disappearance of human discourse or logos in the strict sense. Animals of the species Homo sapiens would react by conditioned reflexes to vocal signs or sign language, and thus their so-called discourses would be like what is supposed to be the language of bees, what would disappear then is not only philosophy or the search for discursive wisdom, but also wisdom itself. Okay, I have to say something about that. That's not going to be possible for those of you to understand who have never read Kozhev or Hegel or thought about the relationship of language to the essence of man, to history, and to time and the end of time, Okay, which I don't know how many of you have. So you should know that the sort of dense and difficult idea presented there in that passage by Kozhev, I do discuss it at the Millerman School in several courses, and I think if you search up uh, Millerman Kozhev here on YouTube, you'll probably find a video or two where I have a little bit of an exposition of that topic in particular. But here the basic idea is, let me give it to you in about 10 seconds, okay? Um, no, I need more than 10 seconds for it. But the idea is that at the end of history, you have the end of humanity, if humanity is primarily historical. But that doesn't mean the disappearance of all human beings from Earth. It means their transformation back into an animal again. That's this first sentence. If man becomes an animal again. Okay, so if man is no longer historical, he's no longer properly human, he's now merely animal. And that also means that his speech is no longer properly human and that his quest for wisdom is no longer a quest for wisdom and so on. Okay, Schmidt echoes these sentiments, but with rather different conclusions. In such a unified world, what remains is neither politics nor state, but culture, civilization, economics, morality, law, art, entertainment, etc. So at the end of history, in this world, after man's um, historical action, things still happen. Okay, you could still go to the casino, you could still flip on the TV, you could still go skip stones on the water, but politics is over. Politics is over, but entertainment is not. So the world of quote unquote entertainment represents the culmination of the shift away from politics. A representation of reality might appear to replace reality. Instead of violent wars, there could be violent video games. Instead of heroic feats, there could be thrilling amusement park rides. Instead of serious thought, there could be intrigues of all sorts, as in a soap opera. It is a world where people spend their lives amusing themselves to death. Schmidt does not reject the possibility of such a world out of hand, 
but believes it will not happen in an entirely autochthonous manner. The acute question, Schmidt writes, to pose is upon whom will fall the frightening power implied in a world embracing economic and technical organization. This question can by no means be dismissed in the belief that everything would then function automatically, that things would administer themselves, and that a government by people over people would be superfluous because human beings would then be absolutely free. For what would they be free? This can be answered by optimistic or pessimistic conjectures, all of which finally lead to an anthropological possession, excuse me, profession of faith. End quote of the Schmidt. Such an artificial world, and by the way, as you read this, okay, Schmidt talking about artificial world of entertainment, everything somehow organized, upon whom will fall the frightening power. If you have any interest in the question of artificial intelligence and whether AI can become a government and all of that, then you should be attuned particularly uh, attentively here to Schmidt's reflections and all the more so to Thiel's uh, use of them and discussion of them. Such an artificial world requires a religion of technicity that has faith in the unlimited power and dominion over nature and in the unlimited potential for change and for happiness in the natural, this-worldly existence of man. For Schmidt, the political theologian, this Babylonian unity represents a brief harmony that prefigures the final catastrophe of the apocalypse. Following the medieval tradition, Schmidt knows and fears that this artificial unity can be brought about only by the shadowy figure of the Antichrist. He will surreptitiously take over the entire world at the end of human history by seducing people with the promise of peace and security. God created the world, Schmidt writes. The Antichrist counterfeits it. The sinister magician recreates the world, changes the face of the earth and subdues nature. Nature serves him for what purpose is a matter of indifference, for any satisfaction of artificial needs, for ease and comfort. Men who allow themselves to be deceived by him see only the fabulous effect. Nature seems to be overcome. The age of security dawns. Everything has been taken care of. A clever foresight and planning replace providence. Unquote. The world where everything seems to administer itself is the world of science fiction, of Stevenson's Snow Crash or of The Matrix for those who choose not to take their red pills. But no representation of reality Teal continues, ever is the same as reality, and one must never lose sight of the larger framework within which the representation exists. The price of abandoning oneself to such an artificial representation is always too high because the decisions that are avoided are always too important. By making people forget that they have souls, the Antichrist will succeed in swindling people out of them. And now we have this section on Leo Strauss. Given the fact that the essay is called The Straussian Moment, you might almost think this is the most important section of the essay. Leo Strauss, proceed with caution. Let's see how Thiel continues. We are at an impasse. On the one hand, we have the newer project of the Enlightenment, which never became comprehensive on a global scale and perhaps always came at too high a price of self-stultification. On the other hand, we have a return to the older tradition, but that return is fraught with far too much violence. The incredibly drastic solutions favored by Schmidt in his dark musings have become impossible after 1945 in a world of nuclear weapons and limitless destruction through technology. What sort of coherent intellectual or practical synthesis is then possible at all? The political philosopher Leo Strauss attempted to solve the central paradox of the postmodern world. The challenge of that task is reflected in the difficulty of Strauss's own writings, which are prohibitively obscurantist to the uninitiated. A representative and not entirely random passage can serve as an illustration, quote, the unity of knowledge and communication of knowledge can also be compared to the combination of man and horse, although not to a centaur. Is that how you pronounce that? Centaur. And I leave that for you to think about. Indeed, there is little in Strauss that is more clear than the need for less transparency. Unchecked, philosophizing poses great risks to philosophers, as well as the cities they inhabit. As in even the most liberal or open-minded regimes, there exist certain deeply problematic truths. Strauss is convinced that he's not the first to have discovered or rediscovered these truths, 
The great writers and philosophers of the past also had known of these matters, but in order to protect themselves from persecution, these thinkers used an esoteric mode of writing in which their literature is addressed, as Strauss puts it, not to all readers, but to trustworthy and intelligent readers only. As a thought experiment, Strauss invites us to consider the position of a historian living in a totalitarian country, a generally respected and unsuspected member of the only party in existence. Okay, so you have a historian, respected, and a member of the only party in existence. As a result of his studies, this historian comes to doubt the soundness of the government-sponsored interpretation of the history of religion. On an exoteric level, this historian will make a passionate defense of the state-sponsored view. Okay, exoteric meaning like on the surface, on the obvious, visible, public-facing side of things. But esoterically, between the lines, he would write three or four sentences in that terse and lively style, which is apt to arrest the attention of young men who love to think. It would be enough for the attentive reader, but not enough for the invariably less intelligent government censors. Alternately, our writer might even state certain truths quite openly by using as a mouthpiece some disreputable character. There would then be good reason for our finding in the greatest literature of the past so many interesting devils, madmen, beggars, sophists, drunkards, epicureans, and buffoons. Okay, are you, are you, uh, hopefully those of you who ought to be following are still following. Okay, the distinction between the esoteric and the exoteric and how you can use a mouthpiece if need be to convey, uh, to convey something between the lines or less obviously um, than if you didn't have recourse to that stratagem. Strauss, continuing now with Thiel, summarizes the benefits of such a strange mode of discourse. It has all the advantages of private communication without having its greatest disadvantage that it reaches only the writer's acquaintances. It has all the advantages of public communication without having its greatest disadvantage, capital punishment for the author. Because there are books and perhaps other writings that do not reveal their full meaning as intended by the author, unless one ponders over them day and night for a long time, cultural relativism and intellectual nihilism are not the final word. Strauss believes there exists a truth about human nature and that this truth can in principle be known to humanity. Indeed, the great writers of the past are in far more agreement about this truth than their exoteric disagreements would lead the superficial reader to believe. For there were more great men who were stepsons of their time or out of step with the future than one would easily believe. These writers only appeared to conform to the diverse cities they inhabited. Strauss alludes to the dangers they faced by reminding us of the warning Goethe had Faust delivered to his assistant. Quoting now that, the few who understand something of men's heart and mind, who were foolish enough not to restrain their full heart, but to reveal their feeling and their vision to the vulgar, have ever been crucified and burned. Okay, let me just say super briefly here. So we do have in Strauss the idea of a human nature and the truth about human nature, but we also have the view that the people who knew it and understood it and taught about it didn't always do so openly and accessibly, and that there's a difficulty. You have to be intelligent. You have to be attentive. You have to be one of those young men or women who love to think, and you have to be willing to read these books day and night, and there are several other guardrails in place, and it takes this extra layer of effort to understand the truth about human nature. And having understood it, you may also be under the obligation to reconceal it again. There are no shortcuts in Strauss, Thiel continues. The philosopher practices what he preaches, and so one will search in vain in Strauss's writings for a systematic statement of the hidden truth. Perhaps Strauss's only incremental concession to the would-be philosopher lies in the fact that his writings are transparently esoteric and hard to understand, in contrast to the past writers who wrote seemingly straightforward books and whose truly esoteric nature was therefore even more obscured. The open agenda of the Straussians, declares Harvard government professor Harvey Mansfield, himself a Straussian, is limited to reading the great books for their own sake and does not include offering dumbed down summaries. Nevertheless, certain themes emerge and recur. The question of the city and humanity, the issues of founding and origins, 
and the relation between religion and the best regime. To generalize a bit more, even if one does not take one's bearings entirely from the exceptional case, as do Machiavelli and Schmidt, it is a case that must not be forgotten, an account of politics that speaks only of the smooth functioning of the machinery of government is incomplete. And one also must consider the circumstances in which this machinery is built or created in the first place, and by extension where it might be threatened or modified and reconstructed. When one widens the aperture of one's investigations, one will find that there are more things in heaven and earth than dreamt of in the modern world of Locke or Montaigne. The fact that these things are hidden does not mean they do not exist or are unknowable. On the problematic question of origins, for instance, Strauss notes the surprising convergence, at least on the level of factual detail, in the Roman myth of the founding of the greatest city of the ancient world, and in what the book of Genesis says about the founding of the first city in the history of the world. Okay, so once again here, Thiel's point is that Strauss has something to say, but it's hard to find and hard to convey, and Strauss deliberately doesn't always say it in the most obvious and easily accessible way. But he does tell us something more than we would learn merely from Enlightenment, from Enlightenment political anthropology and from Enlightenment political thought, which is indisputably the case, to put it mildly and to understate it by a mile. Does Strauss then believe that there cannot be a great and glorious society without the equivalent of the murder of Remus by his brother Romulus? In other words, is the foundation of all great cities uh, violence and even murder? Not to mention fratricide. At first, he seems to suggest that America is the one exception in all of history to this rule, quoting with approval the patriotic Thomas Paine, the independence of America was accompanied by a revolution in the principles and practice of governments, government founded on a moral theory, on a system of universal peace, on the indefeasible hereditary rights of man, is now revolving from west to east by a stronger impulse than the government of the sword revolved from east to west, does Thomas Paine. But within a few pages, we find that even in the case of the American founding, this patriotic account is not necessarily the whole truth. And the reader is informed that perhaps, quote, America owes her greatness not only to her habitual adherence to the principles of freedom and justice, but also to her occasional deviation from them. Moreover, we're told there exists a mischievous interpretation of the Louisiana Purchase and of the fate of the Red Indians. Indeed, the philosopher's decision to write esoterically reminds us that even in America, the most liberal regime in history, there remain politically incorrect taboos. In reminding us of the permanent problems, the political philosopher agrees with the political theologian's exhortation to seriousness and also joins the latter in rejecting the illusory notion that everything has been taken care of. Okay, in other words, Strauss agrees with Schmidt. But because the philosopher does not share all the theologian's hopes and fears, there is more freedom in steering a middle course between the scylla of absolutism and the charbidus of relativism. As Strauss puts it, there is a universally valid hierarchy of ends, but there are no universally valid rules of action. So he says here, there's a similarity between Schmidt and Strauss, but also a difference, okay? Strauss, because he's not a political theologian, because he doesn't think that everything stands and falls with the question of faith in Christ, let's say he can go between relativism and absolutism, okay? To repeat this statement of Strauss's that Thiel here selects, for our attention, quote, there is a universally valid hierarchy of ends, okay, of ends, of the ends of the human life, of 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 that which we should aim at, of that which is good, but there are no universally valid rules of action. Strauss illustrates this claim by reminding us of an extreme situation in which the very existence or independence of a society is at stake. Such an extreme situation is represented by war. What a decent society will do during war will depend to a certain extent on what the enemy, possibly an, un, possibly an absolutely unscrupulous and savage enemy, forces it to do. As a result, here is quoting, Strauss, there are no limits which can be defined in advance. There are no assignable limits to what might become just reprisals. In other words, it's valid end to want to win the war, but you can't limit the means that you're going to use in all cases forever, absolutely, ultimately, and without any possibility of modification or repudiation. Okay, There are no limits which can be defined in advance. There are no assignable limits to what might become just reprisals. And moreover, considerations which apply to foreign enemies may well apply to subversive elements within society. 
The philosopher meaning here Strauss ends with a plea to leave these sad exigencies covered with the veil with which they are justly covered. In other words, it's somehow indecent and inappropriate to talk about, let's call them here for our purposes, um, uh, if not state secrets, then something like that, okay? What it is required, when that it may be required, when it is required, and what it might look like to go above and beyond the law for the sake of legitimate ends. So let us recapitulate, Thiel says, the modern West has lost faith in itself. In the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment period, this loss of faith liberated enormous commercial and creative forces. At the same time, this loss has rendered the West vulnerable. Is there a way to fortify the modern West without destroying it altogether? A way of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which is what it would look like if we accepted fully the Schmidian solution, right? Because then we'd be no longer the West. We'd be defending the West, but destroying it at the same time. So what do you do in this situation? Um, and hopefully you're following the problem as Thiel sees it. At first sight, Strauss seems to offer such a moderate middle course, but his path too is fraught with peril. For as soon as the theoretical esotericism of the philosopher is combined with some sort of practical implementation, self-referential problems abound. The awareness of the problematic nature of the city makes the unreflective defense of the city impossible. I'll comment on that in a second. In this way, Strauss's recovery of the permanent problems paradoxically might make their resolution all the more difficult. Or to frame the matter in terms of Schmidt's eschatology, the Straussian project sets out to preserve the Katehan, but instead becomes a hastener against his will, against its will. No new Alexander is in sight to cut the Gordian knot of our age. Okay, I gotta say something about that because it's probably not self-evident what he means there. So if Leo Strauss teaches that there's a tension between the city and man, between philosophy and law, between the political community and the philosopher who reflects on the fabric of the political community, between not only Athens and Jerusalem, but Athens and Socrates, okay? If he's able to show, Strauss is, that there is a fundamental part of humanity that transcends our civic identity, and therefore that weakens our, what? Our attachment to our country, our nation, or anything that we consider our own, okay? If Strauss has discovered, through his readings of Plato and Aristotle and the history of political philosophy, as well as through his own intelligent observation and careful reflection, that there are these fundamental tensions. Well, that means he can't want to defend the West, and the Straussian political philosopher can't want to defend the West, somehow full-heartedly and somehow innocently, naively, fully, and, uh, you know, in a sort of red-blooded way because he's recognized the truth let's say, for our purposes here, of the transience of all political things or of the fact that even the most perfect political community on earth is still, is still imperfect compared to the other available human excellences like those that you pursue in philosophy and so on. So the idea is that like Strauss can't fully help us through the problem, Thiel seems to be saying here, because Strauss has made us too wise for our own good, okay? Something like that. Not exactly that, right? But something like that, because he says here, uh, awareness of the problematic nature of the city, which is part of the wisdom of Straussianism, makes the unreflective defense of the city impossible. Whereas apparently the implication here is that we need unreflective defense of the city. Although you could fairly ask yourself, since you know Thiel's writing is not as straightforward as it might seem to be, and it probably doesn't seem to be because it's quite a difficult essay in and of itself, but why not reflective defense of the city? So there are a lot of, I have some issues here with uh, Thiel's formulations, but never mind that. I'll get out of the way and let's continue with the essay. So to repeat, Strauss's path is fraught with peril. Okay. And in this way, Strauss's recovery of the permanent problems, paradoxically, that would be his wisdom, right? Paradoxically might make their resolution all the more difficult. That would be called two eyes for our own good. Moreover, a direct path forward is prevented by America's constitutional machinery. By setting ambition against ambition, with an elaborate system of checks and balances, it prevents any single ambitious person from reconstructing the old republic. 
America's founders enjoyed a freedom of action far surpassing that of America's subsequent politicians. Eventually, ambitious people would come to learn there's little one can do in politics and that all merely political careers end in failure. The intellectual paralysis of self-knowledge has its counterpoint in the political paralysis embedded in our open system of government. So it's like, I guess, even, you know, if Strauss had discovered something and you could go back and tweak the founding principles, well, no, you can't now. That ship has sailed. That door has closed. The founding's done. And when nobody has now the latitude that the founders had in laying down the law then. Still, though, Thiel continues, there are more possibilities for action than first appear, precisely because there are more domains than those enumerated by the conventional legal or juridical system. Uh, it just reminds me, I saw an interview, I think it was with, I think it was with Teal once about his time at PayPal, when he said that what PayPal was doing was um, ahead of where the legislation was. So it's not that what they were doing at some point, something like this, okay, this isn't perfectly the case, but it's enough to make the point here. It's not that what they were doing was illegal because it wasn't addressed by the law yet. It was somehow extra legal. And he said that their goal in developing the technology was to move faster than the law. So they were operating operating in a domain that was not yet under the law. So there are such domains. Okay, so as he puts it here, you see, uh, there are more domains than those enumerated by the conventional legal or juridical system. Roberto Calasso reminds us of the alternative thread in The Ruin of Cash. Uh, quote, the period between 1945 and the present could conceivably be rendered in two parallel histories, that of the historians with its elaborate apparatus of parameters discussing figures, masses, parties, movements, negotiations, productions, and that of the secret services telling of murders, traps, betrayals, assassinations, cover-ups, and weapons shipments. We know that both accounts are insufficient, that both claim to be sufficient, that one could never be translated into the other, and that they will continue their parallel lives. But hasn't this perhaps always been the case? Strauss also reminds us of the exceptional framework needed to supplement the American regime. Quoting Strauss, the most just society cannot survive without intelligence, i.e. espionage, even though espionage is impossible, without a suspension of certain rules of natural right. Again, there's no disagreement with Tennyson on ends, and that refers back to the opening poem, which you can look at, as I said, and you should do so after the essay, but only on means. Instead of the United Nations filled with interminable and inconclusive parliamentary debates that resemble Shakespearean tales told by idiots, we should consider echelon, the secret coordination of the world's intelligence services, as the decisive path to a truly global Pax Americana. Okay, so what you see Teal is saying here, uh, Strauss reminds us when he says that there are no, um, how did he put it, there are no universal uh, uh, rules. So you have, the, you have the ends, but you don't have the rules. You gotta pull that sentence back up. Uh, again, I don't think so you remember. So the point here is, okay, fine. It may seem like you're going to do it through, uh, through institutions like the United Nations, or it may seem like you're gonna do it with an obvious and self-evidently moralistic veneer. But look, the secrets of state and secrets of statecraft, as you know, means those things that are justly um, remain justly veiled up to and including uh, espionage and assassination and cover-ups and murders and traps and betrayals and all of that. Okay, so to repeat here, instead of the United Nations, we should consider echelon the secret coordination of the world's intelligence services as the decisive path to a truly global Pax Americana. Liberal critics who disagree with the philosopher also tend to dislike the philosopher's politics. Just as there appears to be something shaky and problematic about a theoretical framework that is not subject to the give and take of open debate, like which would be the case if you had the secret society assassinations and all of that, so there appears to be something subversive and immoral about a political framework that operates outside the checks and balances of representative democracy as described in high, high school textbooks. Whoops, sorry for moving it around on screen. But if American liberalism is decisively incomplete, then its critique is no longer quite so decisive. Um, hold on, I want to say something here. I just want to make, say something. So you have two things. You have the need for esotericism in the communication of wisdom among the political philosophers, or at least esotericism in saying something about the pursuit of wisdom. At any rate, 
in some key respect, the philosopher has to hide himself, has to conceal himself, and has to, uh, his message has to be somehow cryptographic, okay? Cryptic, at least, hidden and uh, concealed from the masses. And the parallel in the political sphere is this secret state activity, uh, up to and including those things that we mentioned. So there's a parallelism between the concealment of the philosopher is writing between the lines and the concealment of the state's activity, as it were, acting through back channels and acting between the lines. Uh, let's go back here. So um, liberal critics who disagree. Okay, we said that. Let's pick it up here. There appears to be something subversive and immoral about a political framework that operates outside the checks and balances of representative democracy as described in high school textbooks. But if American liberalism is decisively incomplete, then its critique is no longer quite so decisive. In other words, I think Thiel is saying here, uh, if there's more to liberalism than meets the eye, because liberalism also includes this concealed path of secret state activity, then the criticism of liberalism doesn't apply as fully because it only applies to the visible but not the invisible side of liberalism. For the Straussian, Thiel writes, there can be no fundamental disagreement with Oswald Spangler's call for action at the dramatic finale of um, The Decline of the West. And I'm not going to read this, but if you pull up The Decline of the West, Volume 2 PDF, and you scroll to the last paragraph, this is what you'll find. And the key sentence for our purposes about this, while well, there are a few things I guess we can say very, very briefly, the first is that um, Spangler is talking about destiny, fate, and the fates, and how we follow them where they lead. We go where we must as uh, following the direction of fate, the fates, destiny, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, what's really weird about this, I just wrote an essay in response to Thiel's Straussian moment that's going to be published later this month where I say something about this passage. So I sort of want to, want to defer uh, my comments to uh, until then. And, you know, you, you guys can look at that when it comes out. But the weird thing here, I mean, not that, not that you need... Okay. We have the Straussian moment. That's the name of Thiel's essay. Somehow there's something uniquely important about Strauss for his analysis, so it seems. And the end of his analysis of Strauss, the end of his section on Strauss, you know, culminates in this view that there can be no fundamental disagreement between the Straussian and what Spangler says here. And I tell you, and those of you who know Leo Strauss, and those of you who know Oswald Spangler, and those of you who can make more sense of this than those who are unfamiliar with Spangler and Strauss, will know that this is not quite true. And uh, Thiel, no doubt, knows that it's not quite true and why he would say something here about Strauss and Spangler that's not quite true is a question. But we leave that question aside and turn from Strauss to Girard. René Girard, The End of the City of Man. In spite of the inspiring sweep of the Straussian project, Thiel writes, there remains a nagging suspicion that perhaps it is missing something fundamental altogether. And if the French literary theorist René Girard is even partially correct in his extraordinary account of the history of the world, then the Straussian moment of triumph may prove to be brief indeed. In important ways, the Girardian analysis of the modern West echoes some of the themes already discussed. As with Schmidt and Strauss, Girard also believes there exists a disturbing truth about the city and humanity, and that the whole issue of human violence has been whitewashed away by the Enlightenment. Okay, so we have here a commonality between Schmidt, Strauss, and Girard, the commonality being that there exists a disturbing truth about the city and humanity, and the commonality being that the Enlightenment has whitewashed away the issue of human violence. Moreover, there will come an hour when this truth is completely known. No single question has more of a future today than the question of man. 
He writes, quoting Girard, evidently. The possibility of moving beyond the unknowable human ex of John Locke and the 18th century rationalists had already been implicit in the entire project of evolutionary science during the 19th century. Just as Darwin's The Origin of Species transformed the natural sciences, some other writers' The Origin of Religions will provide the logical and chronological sequel and one day transform the sciences of humanity. For Girard, this post-Darwinian account must somehow combine the gradualism of Darwinian evolution with the essentialism of the pre-Darwinians, stressing both the continuity and discontinuity of humanity with the rest of the natural order. This more comprehensive account of human nature will be centered on an insight already contained in Aristotelian biology. Quote, man differs from the other animals in his greater aptitude for imitation, unquote. Here, one has both a difference of kind and one of degree, which can provide the basis for a synthesis between Aristotle and Darwin. Such a synthesis and relationship was already hinted at in the time of Shakespeare, when the word ape already meant both primate and to imitate, which you know, right? To ape somebody, to imitate them. So this idea that imitation could be that which links pre and post Darwinian um, science of man. However, the new science of humanity, Thiel continues, must drive the idea of imitation or mimesis much further than it has in the past. According to Girard, all cultural institutions, beginning with the acquisition of language by children from their parents, require this sort of mimetic activity, and so it is not overly reductionist to describe human brains as gigantic imitation machines. Because humanity would not exist without imitation, one cannot say there's something wrong with imitation per se, or that those humans who imitate others are somehow inferior to those who do not. The latter group, according to Girard, simply does not exist, even though it remains the most cherished myth of a diverse array of modern ideologies to celebrate an utterly fictional human self that exists independent of everyone else. So you don't have an independently existing individual I that is um, somehow unrelated to others, even in its fundamental conception, nor available to itself without relationship to other people. This idea of an atomistic, individualistic I is off the table for Thiel in his presentation of Girard here, because to be human is to be imitative. To imitate is to imitate others. Therefore, just as in Heidegger, to describe the human being also means to describe us as always being with others. So for Girard to discuss the human being is always to discuss us in terms of imitating others. Nevertheless, the necessity of mimesis does not render it un unproblematic. So it's necessary, but a problem. Conventionally, one tends to think of imitation as primarily representational, as in the learning of language and the transmission of various cultural institutions, but nothing prevents mimesis from extending into the acquisitive realm or stops people from emulating the desires of others. In the process of keeping up with the Joneses, mimesis pushes people into escalating rivalry. This disturbing truth of mimesis may explain why the knowledge about mimesis remains rather suppressed in an almost unconscious way. Of all the mortal sins of medieval Catholicism, envy is the one closest to mimetic rivalry, and it is the one mortal sin that still remains a cultural taboo, even in the most avant-garde postmodern circles. And finally, because the mimetic ability is more advanced in humans than in other animals, there exist in us no instinctual breaks that are strong enough to limit the scope of such rivalry. Thus, at the core of the mimetic account, there exists a mystery. What exactly happened in the distant past when all the apes were reaching for the same object, when the rivalry between mimetic doubles threatened to escalate into unlimited violence? For the philosophers of the Enlightenment, the war of all against all would culminate in a recognition by the warring parties of the irrationality of such a war. Okay, you guys know, or you may know, war of all against all, if we're talking about the Enlightenment or we're talking in terms of modernity, you have here the social contract theory of Hobbes, uh, of Locke, man in a state of nature. And how do you get around that, that in a state of nature, there's a war of all against all? Uh, well, you recognize the irrationality of war. And to continue now with uh, Thiel's description of the social contract tradition, in the midst of the crisis, the warring parties would sit down, have a sober conversation, 
and draw up a social contract that would provide the basis for a peaceful society. Because Girard rightly views this account as preposterous, he considers the social contract to be the fundamental lie of the Enlightenment, a lie so brazen that none of the advocates of the social contract theory, from Hobbes to Rousseau, themselves believed it to be the case that an actual contract had ever been signed. In Girard's alternative account of these matters, the war of all against all culminates not in a social contract, but in a war of all against one. As the same mimetic forces gradually drive the combatants to gang up on one particular person. The war continues to escalate and there's no rational stopping point, at least not until this person becomes the scapegoat whose death helps to unite the community and bring about a limited peace for the survivors. That murder is the secret origin of all religious and political institutions and is remembered and transfigured in the form of myth. The scapegoat perceived as the primal source of conflict and disorder had to die for there to be peace. By violence, violence was brought to an end and society was born. But because society rests on the belief in its own order and justice, the founding act of violence must be concealed. Incidentally, here you see this sort of parallelism with the question of the foundations of uh, property, the origins of property. So there the violence had to be concealed for one reason. Nevertheless, it was there. And here violence has to be concealed for another reason. Okay, Because society rests on belief in its own order and justice, the founding act of violence must be concealed by the myth that the slain victim was really guilty. Thus, violence is lodged at the heart of society. Myth is merely discourse ephemeral to violence. Myth sacralizes the violence of the founding murder. Myth tells us that the violence was justified because the victim really was guilty, and at least in the context of archaic cultures, truly was powerful. Myth transfigures the murdered scapegoats into gods, and religious rituals reenact the founding murder through the sacrifice of human or animal substitutes, thereby creating a kind of peace that is always mixed with a certain amount of violence. The centrality of sacrifice was so great that those who managed to defer or avoid execution became the objects of veneration. Every king is a sort of living god, and therein lies the true origin of monarchy. Quoting, uh, presumably, um, Gerard here, there's no culture without a tomb and no tomb without a culture. In the end, the tomb is the first and only cultural symbol. The above ground tomb does not have to be invented. It is the pile of stones in which the victim of unanimous stoning is buried. It is the first pyramid. That is how things used to work. But now, Teal continues, we live in a world where the cat is out of the bag, at least to the extent that we know that the scapegoat really is not as guilty as the persecuting community claims. So again, before we didn't know, we thought that the scapegoat was guilty, but now we do know that the scapegoat is not guilty, or at least not as guilty. So the scapegoat mechanism has been revealed. Because the smooth functioning of human culture depended on a lack of understanding of this truth of human culture, the archaic rituals will no longer work for the modern world. As in Hegel, the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only at dusk. The unveiling of the mythical past opens toward a future in which we no longer believe in any of the myths. In a dramatic rupture with the past, they will have been deconstructed and thereby discredited. But unlike Hegel, our knowledge of our hidden history, of the things hidden since the foundation of the world, which is the title of one of Gerard's works, does not automatically bring about a glorious final synthesis. Because these founding myths also served the critical role of distinguishing between legitimate and illegitimate violence, their unraveling may deprive humanity of the efficacious functioning of the limited and sacred violence it needed to protect itself from unlimited and desacralized violence. So to interject here, the myths serve the purpose. When you've demythologized it by showing the truth of the scapegoat mechanism, it can no longer serve that purpose. And one of those purposes it did serve was um, was here distinguishing between limited and sacred violence and unlimited and desacralized violence. And so you have a situation. And for Girard, this situation or this combination of mimesis and the unraveling of archaic culture implies that the modern world contains a powerfully apocalyptic dimension. 
From a Girardian perspective, the current political debates remain inadequate to the contemporary world situation to the extent that, across the spectrum, there remains a denial of the founding role of the violence caused by human mimesis, imitation, and therefore a systematic underestimation of the scope of apocalyptic violence. Nuclear weapons pose a horrific dilemma, but one could just barely imagine a nuclear standoff in which a handful of states remain locked in a cold war. But what if mimesis drives others to try and acquire these same weapons for the mimetic prestige they confer so that the technological situation is never static, but instead contains a powerful escalatory dynamic? Okay, so you see, you have the problem of violence, but you have the possibility of a spiral of violence due to a mimetic desire, which could lead to an escalatory dynamic. One may define a liberal as someone who knows nothing of the past and of this history of violence and still holds to the enlightenment view of the natural goodness of humanity. And one may define a conservative as someone who knows nothing of the future and of the global world that is destined to be and still therefore believes that the nation state or other institutions rooted in sacred violence can contain unlimited human violence. The present risks a terrible synthesis of the blind spots in that doctrinaire thinking, a synthesis of violence and globalization in which all the boundaries on violence are abolished, be they geographic, professional, for example, civilian non-combatants, or demographic, for example, children, at the extremes, even the distinction between violence inflicted on oneself and violence inflicted on other people is in the process of evaporating. In the disturbing new phenomenon of suicide murders, the word that best describes this unbounded apocalyptic violence is terrorism. Okay, a couple of things to say about that. First of all, he's linking here with the idea of suicide bombers and uh, terrorism, the opening theme of the essay, September 11th, needless to say. But what is he telling us? He's telling us that both liberals and conservatives are unequipped to deal with the new situation. They lack the conceptual resources to think it through, one, because they're blind to the meaning of the past, another one because they're blind to the tendencies of the future, and both of them because they fail to understand the implicit risk and threat here of escalating mimetic cycles as concerns of violence. Okay, so... Uh, up to and including the overcoming not only of national, geographic, and uh, demographic boundaries, but even the boundary between self and other. Indeed, one may wonder whether any sort of politics will remain possible for the exceptional generation that has learned the truth of human history for the first time. It is in this context that one must remember that the word apocalypse originally meant unveiling. For Gerard, the unveiling of this terrible knowledge opens a catastrophic fault line below the city of man. It is truly the end of the world, the Christian apocalypse, the bottomless abyss of the unforgettable victim. Next section, history and knowledge, as we come close to the end of the Straussian moment and see how does Thiel now take these various strands, these various counter-enlightenment figures and how they relate to the foundation of modern politics and to the problem of um, the throwdown of Islamic terrorism and Islamization to Western political modernity and all of that. And uh, how does he bring it together, summarize it and conclude? So let's see, history and knowledge. In the debate between Strauss and Girard, Thiel writes, perhaps the key issue of contention can be reduced to a question of time. When will this highly disturbing knowledge burst upon general awareness? render all politics impossible, and finally bring the city of man to an end. If there's something prophetic about Girard's announcement of the founding murder, then Strauss might note that his situation also resembles the plight faced by Nietzsche's madman announcing the death of God to an unbelieving world. Quote, I come too early. My time has not yet come. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of man. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds require time even after they are done, before they can be seen and heard. The deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars, and yet it is they who have done it. 
For Strauss, as for Nietzsche, the truth of the mimesis and of the founding murder is so shocking that most people in all times and places simply will not believe it. You know, I interject here. It's kind of like the guy in Plato's cave allegory in the Republic, if you know it, who the first time he's liberated from the shadows, he runs back down. Okay, eventually, obviously, also the liberator is killed, but people have a tendency not to want to believe a truth that they regard as shocking. The world of the Enlightenment may have been based on certain misconceptions about the nature of humanity, but the full knowledge of these misconceptions can remain the province of the philosophical elite. The successful popularization of such knowledge would be the only thing to fear, and it was in this context that the Straussian peer Manent launched a ferocious attack on Girard's theory. Quote, if human culture is essentially founded on violence, then Girard can bring nothing other than the destruction of humanity in the fallacious guise of nonviolence. Girard, in turn, would counter that salvation is no longer to be found in philosophical reticence because there will come a day when there's no esoteric knowledge left. And then we have a quote from Girard, but before we get there, I want to pause. Do you see the criticism that Manent makes? Human society, human political community, human history, the meaning of human life together rests on this strange, mysterious founding violence, whether you like it or not. And if you lay bare that foundation, you're going to destroy the possibility of human society, human culture, human political community, human life. It's kind of like, roughly, in Kojev, if man is historical and history has come to an end, man is no longer man. In this case, he reverts back to being an animal. And now his action is no different from a bee making honey or from, you know, a, a dog licking its paw. It's deprived of meaningful human significance. So too, if human life as we've known it is oriented by this mystery of violence and we make that mystery transparently available to everybody, like, hey, here's a free pass for everybody in the world to enter our secret society because there are no more secrets and it's now an open society. Well, good for you, but you've destroyed the foundations of human life in doing so. So how does Girard reply? I do think it is necessary for us to engage in the discourse we have been pursuing here, Girard writes. But if we had chosen otherwise, others would have taken up this discourse, and there will be others in any case who will repeat what we are in the process of saying and who will advance matters beyond what we've been able to do. Yet books themselves will have no more than minor importance. The events within which such books emerge will be infinitely more eloquent than whatever we write and will establish um, will establish truths we have difficulty describing and describe poorly, even in simple and banal instances. They are already very simple, indeed too simple to interest our current Byzantium, but these truths will become simpler still. They will soon be accessible to everyone. I want to pause and comment. In other words, the revelation of this truth is coming, like it or not, and it's not coming as a function of books. For Girard, the knowledge of the founding murder is driven by the historical working of the Judeo-Western revelation. The revelation may be slow because it contains a message that humans do not wish to hear, but it is not reversible. For this reason, the decisive difference between Girard and Strauss or Nietzsche centers on the question of historicism. On the level of the individual, even at the end, there will still remain a choice of sorts between Jerusalem and Athens. We have Sir Thomas More, a Christian saint, as a helper in making that choice. In his dialogue of comfort against tribulation, Moore declares, quote, to prove that this life is no laughing time, but rather the time of weeping, we find that our Savior himself wept twice or thrice, but never find we that he laughed so much as once. I will not swear that he never did, but at least he gave us no example of it. But on the other side, he left us example of weeping, unquote. The saint knew that the opposite had been true of Socrates, who left us no example of weeping, but left us example of laughter. Okay, so this, I don't want to tell you everything that there is to say about what's going on in these passages, but look at the following. Okay, so uh, the decisive difference between Girard and Strauss centers on the question of historicism. Is this an inevitable revelation that will come to light over time or not? But whether it is or not, the choice Jerusalem or Athens remains on the individual level. 
Okay, but the world has not yet come to an end. Teal continues, and there's no easy telling how long the twilight of the modern age will endure. What then must be done by the Christian statesman or stateswoman aspiring to be a wise steward for our time? Okay, what is to be done? The negative answers are straightforward. There can be no return to the archaic world or even to the robust conception of the political envisioned by Carl Schmitt. There can be no real accommodation with the Enlightenment, since so many of its easy bromides have become deadly falsehoods in our time. But also there cannot be a decision to avoid all decisions and to retreat into studying the Bible in anticipation of the second coming, for then one will have ceased to be a statesman or stateswoman. The Christian statesman or stateswoman must diverge from the teachings of Strauss in one decisive respect. Unlike Strauss, the Christian statesman or stateswoman knows that the modern age will not be permanent and ultimately will give way to something very different. One must never forget that one day all will be revealed, that all injustices will be exposed, and that those who perpetrated them will be held to account. And so, in determining the correct mixture of violence and peace. Okay, so remember, we can't go all in on the violence. That seems somehow too Schmidian. Can't go all in on peace. Somehow that also seems too naive. Maybe too much of the Enlightenment effort to paper over the important areas that can become violent. So in determining the correct mixture of violence and peace, the Christian statesman or stateswoman would be wise in every close case to side with peace. There is no formula to answer the critical question of what constitutes a close case. That must be decided in every specific instance. It may well be that the cumulative decisions made in all those close instances will determine the destiny of the postmodern world. For that world could differ from the modern world in a way that is much worse or much better. The limitless violence of runaway mimesis or the peace of of the kingdom of God. That is the end of Peter Thiel's Straussian moment. And so if you've heard of this essay, but you've never read it, or if you've never heard of it, but you're intrigued by it, you should pull it up, give it another read, your own set of eyes, pause, underline, make your notes, think about the opening poem, Think about the arguments here, moving from September 11th to the question of human nature, to Locke, Schmidt, Strauss, Girard, to what must be done by the Christian statesman or stateswoman, and ultimately to what's at stake. And what's at stake? The limitless violence of runaway mimesis or the peace of the kingdom of God. So, there you go. I hope that you enjoyed what is a rather brilliant and very thought-provoking piece of writing and that you're intrigued and surprised that one of the world's most famous millionaires should be the author of this kind of analysis. And I hope that you see it hasn't lost a shred of relevance in the time since it was written and that in no way can we avoid the questions that it raises. Moreover, we should all think through very carefully the authors that he puts before us to think about. Strauss, First and foremost, maybe. I mean, it's called the Straussian moment, but Girard, Schmidt, and other authors who are mentioned in passing implicitly in some cases, explicitly in others, Machiavelli, Nietzsche, for sure. This whole problem that he set out for us merits our close attention. If any of that interests you and you want to go deeper into these questions, obviously you have lectures on this channel about Strauss and Schmidt and others and courses at millermanschool.com on many of these great thinkers. And it's in millermanschool.com where we're going to be discussing this essay in much greater detail as well. So take a look at that, pull it up, read it, reread it, study it, enjoy it. Peter Thiel's Straussian moment. I hope you uh, got something out of that. See you in the next video.